all of us have characteristics and behavior patterns that were passed down to us from the previous generation. For some of us, that's really good news, but for some of us, not so much. If you find yourself repeating the same behaviors over and over again, there's a way to stop doing that. There's a better way. We're going to show you today how to identify and break free from harmful generational patterns. You're not going to want to miss this. Here we go for season two of the Reboot Recovery Show. So welcome to season two of the Reboot Recovery Show. I'm Evan Owens. It is so awesome to be with you. The purpose of the show is for us to be able to overcome trauma together so that we can embrace a brighter future. We're doing things a little bit different here for season two. Instead of it just being me by myself, I've got some amazing co-hosts this season. That's right. First, I've got the doctor of all doctors, the prognosticator of all prognosticators, Dr. Brooke Keels. She's with an organization called Mercy Multiplied. If you've never checked them out, you need to. They do incredible work helping women uh, overcome all kinds of, of thing, painful things in their past. And she's going to share some of that with us today. Also with me, I have best-selling author of Behind the Badge on Spiritual Combat, uh, a bunch of other awesome books, including <laughs> Why I Shower With My Eyes Closed. Um, <laughs> yep. I have Adam Davis with me today. Welcome, you guys, to the Reboot Recovery Show. I'm super excited to have you all here. Evan, thank you. It is awesome to be here. I hope that my hair is fitting for the occasion. We're going to have a lot of fun. It is. And those who are listening, Adam is wearing a hat to hide his very shiny and yet bald and beautiful. <laughs> Okay. It's bald and this may be the first time I've done my hair in like, I don't know, since COVID started, so I yeah, yeah, yeah. will be very happy. He'll be like, what'd you do today? Well, that's that's perfect. So did you like my name? Did, did you like the name of the new book I came out with? So Why I Shower With My Eyes Closed? I think it's an instant classic. I think it's, you know, it's it's really it good. Is. You know, we, we all have something in common, all of the three of us plus everyone listening, which is every one of us has a father and a mother. Now, not all of us necessarily, though, had what we would refer to as a mom or a dad. Maybe we've never even met our biological parents. But at some point, two people came together and they created us, which presents all sorts of opportunities, but also some challenges, right? And for some of the folks listening, they inherited and learned patterns from their parents that led to things like peace, uh, healthy relationships, strong coping mechanisms, uh, and faith. But for other people listening, maybe they inherited some general operational patterns that, that have been less helpful to them. And we've found that if these generational patterns aren't broken, if they aren't healed, a lot of times we end up repeating the same mistakes as the generation before us. And that's something that, that really troubles me. I've always talked about how trauma is contagious, and unless it's intercepted, it passes down to the next Generation. So today, what I want to do is give our listeners some reliable ways that they can start not only identifying those generational patterns, what do they say is acceptance is the first step, right? Not only do we have to identify that first step, but then also to learn how to either build upon the healthy patterns or break the unhealthy ones. And so that's kind of thing. So I guess my first question, let's, let's start with some vulnerability. Let's get people to know us a little bit. Have we noticed any generational patterns in our life that maybe were passed down or things that we were that were good that we like or things that maybe we'd like to break free from? What are some examples you guys have seen in your life? Adam, would yeah, you like yeah, to go first? Yeah, this, you talk about being messy. This is going to be messy. This, listen, um, there, there's a few different ways I could go with this. There's some very practical things, but, you know, on the forefront, uh, you know, talk about anxiety and how it's passed down generation to generation. My mother uh, biological mother, worry, wart, anxiety, like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and then you go back to her mother and then you go back to, you know, you, you go back and you start listening to the stories of these various, uh, people in that lineage. And, and so that's, you know, maybe not exactly what we're talking about, but I can tell you that when I started sharing about being, uh, raped as a little five-year-old boy, uh, things that happened to me as a teenager in the church, um, 
uh, that vulnerability. I, Mark Batterson says it like this. Your bravery creates a moment for someone else's breakthrough. And so when I started sharing these things, more people in my family was like, I don't know if you know this, but. And then it went back as far as I could trace that every single one, it happened to. It happened to. And so I started looking at this and I'm like, what's the problem? The problem was nobody along the way. Nobody along the way stood up and said, this happened to me and I'm about to cut the head off the snake. Like I am done with this and I'm going to address it. And so I started to address it and it created some flack. But uh, talking about those things, uh, you know, oftentimes if families don't communicate, we don't talk about the pain. We don't know what actually exists. So I've noticed a few of those patterns in my own life, but I've also noticed positive patterns and those are resiliency. You know, uh, every single person that's been through something like that has bounced back. They've overcame and they're better because of, they came back better because of the resilience. So, you know, I think in my life, that's a few examples to share. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really Brooke, good. how about you? Yeah. And, oh gosh, sure. <laughs> um, and I think from just, you know, I'll just deal with what kind of is a consistent issue in my life is that my dad was a workaholic. Okay. So he had 17 jobs and that's what he did. And, but he was never home. And he was also in the name of the ministry. Right. And wow. so I was, yeah. And, you know, you, it just would put you in such a double bind as a kid. So he was a psychologist and a pastor. Um, and my mom was a social worker and I'm an only child. So very s- screwed up there. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> just all the things that come with that. Um, but, you know, he, he would just be yeah. out. So it's like, you know, somebody says they're going to commit suicide. So he's off handling that. And I'm just like, but I really want you at my basketball game. And then I would feel like just so bound up by like wanting him to be with us when I knew he was helping other people. Um, and, and through that, what really came out of it was control. And so then myself, like I love to work, it gives to me and that is such a good thing, but it ended up being at the expense of my family. I was seeing the same stuff happen. And thankfully, you know, my husband stepped in and was like, this is not going to be our life, right? You can't go get all of your needs met out here and be told how great you are and then come home and have to, you know, your three-year-old doesn't tell you how special you are every day, by the way. Wow. Um, and so, you know, just really fighting for that balance. And, and I had so much resentment towards him, towards my dad. And I had to really dig in and, and kind of what you're saying, Adam, too, is like, there's a both and, right? So I realized I was like, why did he do that to begin with? Well, my dad thought he was providing for us because he wasn't provided for financially. So that felt unstable. So he goes, I'm going to provide so much financially that you will never feel unstable, you know? And so that to him was stability and then realizing, okay, now I have an opportunity to be proud of the work I do and work hard and do all of that, but not at the expense of my family. Like, how can I, you know, learn from the, learn from the the negative things that hurt, heal, forgive from all that. And then also take those good things um, and, you know, and grow Mul- those as well. Like at the same time, yeah, right? multiply we, them. Right. How do we grieve and be grateful at the same time? And so that's mm. what I currently deal with. So. I love that. Two things I pulled from those answers, you know, how do we grieve and be grateful at the same time? What yeah. powerful words. And then also I loved your quote from Mark, your bravery becomes somebody else's breakthrough. I mean, that's gold right there. And I think for some people, this idea of generational patterns, I've noticed when talking to people, a lot of times they really haven't given it much thought. Right. I mean, or, or what they do is they identify behaviors in their family that drives them crazy or things that they don't appreciate, things that they don't like. But they've never really thought, hmm, I wonder if any of that is imprinted on me in my life now. Maybe that level of introspection. So I guess let's just rattle off. What are some examples of harmful generational patterns? What are some things that maybe you've seen in those that, that I know all of us have done lots of counseling over the years? What are some examples to, to maybe somebody will be listening and be like, wow, I never thought about it. But yeah, that is, that is a generational pattern for, for me. Um, I, I think we, so we yeah. already mentioned a couple anxiety. You know, work I, all I, yeah, I think that we it. learn from, from, from the past, whether it's good or bad. And, you know, growing up, you know, my parents divorced when I was very young and then all the other stuff happened. I think that we, 
especially when we see pain at an early age. And, and, I, and I harp on that because I think there's a lot of people that talk about bad things that happen when you're an adult, right? But when you're, when you're developing and you see divorce, you see pain, you see how adults respond to adversity, then I think that what that does is that sort of brands in your brain, okay, this is how you're supposed to do this, right? If things get hard when you're married, you leave. If you, things get hard in your family, you mm-hmm. cut you cut ties. I mean, I'm not talking about major issues. I'm talking about if you have a disagreement over what to have on Thanksgiving, right? And who disagrees for Thanksgiving? But you, you notice these things, and then over time, um, it, it's passed down. Your children learn it from you, and their children learn it from them. But it's just this is the way we do things. This is how we're supposed to handle it, you know? Every Every college football season in the South, Somebody shoots their cousin because of because of the Iron Bowl, the Alabama Auburn game, you know, alcoholism. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna yes, we're should, gonna we're right? gonna get tore yes, up on some natty light Saturday night, and you know, but that's what we're supposed to do. And the only way we know that is because it's a learned yeah. behavior. And so alcoholism, workaholism. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the all isms. You know, you look at what is not contributing to a positive uh, outcome in your life. What is not helping you become healthier every day? What is not helping you accomplish your goals and be a better person, a spouse, parent, yeah. whatever? Those things have got to be addressed. But I think when we don't address them and we suppress them and we say, uh, I'm afraid, fear. Fear is one that is a generational pattern, right? Fear is generational. And if we don't address right. it early on, then we pass it down to our kids and we teach them it's okay to be afraid. And so they don't go after the things they really, really desire deep down in their heart and soul. So I think those are a few. I could probably talk about that for four or five hours. So I'll shut up now. Yeah. Science yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> Brooke. Yeah. Brooke, what, no, else? what are it. some other examples? Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it can honestly, I, I think, I think, Adam, you actually pinpointed. It's, it's whatever we see and then make this root agreement with, with the enemy, right? And so if Great. whether it's five, whatever developmental stage, so if it's, you know, okay, people, you have a disagreement, you leave. I, that's what we do, right? And this agreement that we make that the enemy's whispering in, and I'm not trying to make it weird and over-spiritualize it, but when he comes to steal things, that's what he's trying to, right? Come into agreement with me and out of agreement with the Lord. And especially if you don't even know what that is, So now, you know, you're an adult walking around and you're like, I don't know why every time I get in a fight with my significant other, I get real itchy and I'm like, I got to (laughs) go, I got to get out. I don't know what that is. And so kind of even uh, the thing is like, I mean, it can be things also like perfectionism or you mentioned fear. How do we control like whatever the thing is that steals from us, that gives us this idea that if I can do X, Y, and Z, then I will somehow survive or I won't get hurt. Like anything that protects Mm. us that we think it is, you know, and it could literally be anything. And so I I think one way, and I won't get too far into this because I I know we're going there, but what are the things that like, man, I reacted really strangely to that. Or somebody's like, are you that upset that you dropped your phone? Or are you that, you know, like what are the behaviors that come out and then digging into those root places you know, again, that we're not, we're not seeking, you know, just like I got angry. So I'm angry about dropping my phone. Hang on. That was a little too much. What's that about? Right. And letting the Lord dig into, you know, because when things don't go right, your life is a mess. And so I need everything yeah. to go right. Right. Or whatever. The th- Absolutely. So I didn't really give you a list, but yeah, I mean, we can go all the traumas and all the bad stuff, but it's also whatever we use to control how we want our life to be. Right. At the end of the day, and, is going to be an agreement we made out of those generational patterns. That's right. So yeah, and I think it's so good. I mean, I think for me that that fine line between what's a generational pattern and what's really an ungodly belief that I hold. You know, our beliefs shape our behaviors, and so many times I, I see things even in my own life. You know, I have a tendency to. There's always something physically wrong with me that I'm blowing out of proportion. I don't just have a headache. I have a brain tumor. Right. This is a this is a, a mindset. Don't laugh now. Don't laugh. There's somebody listening who empathizes with how I feel right now. So no, I'm my point sorry. is, yes. you know, you, that sounds really you, know hard. you guys are lousy counselors. My goodness. <laughs> Nobody wants to, I'm just teasing with you all. But the point is, the point is that's, that's an example of a belief, right? A belief that something tragic is going to happen to my health. 
that might start as a single idea, but that spreads or, or, or alcoholism, addiction, relationship yeah. dysfunction, um, temper, you mentioned, right? The ability to control our anger, our emotions. I see a lot of times, that, well, well, that's just, I'm the kind of person that fill in the blank. When, when I have this, this is what I do. And I hear that all the time. Well, I'm the kind of person that does this. And it's like, okay, well, what makes you that kind of person? And is that the kind of person that you actually want to be? Or are you just accepting that's kind of who you are? In that, and I see all these agreements. I love that idea of agreeing with that that generational pattern, you know, and just sort of it's it's swimming with the the direction that the current's already going, right? And looking at the fruit, I always say, if you want to see where this generational pattern leads, look at the fruit of others where that pattern has led. And there's some great articles on this online. There's some great lists of generational patterns that are passed down. But I even yeah. find that things as as far as how do we deal with stress? How do passivity is an example of a generational pattern. Maybe I just, you know, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Lack of self-responsibility, blaming other people, um, right? Those are all things, tuning the <coughs> world out. Those are all examples of generational patterns that some people could say, well, that's just how I am. You know, that's just, that's just how I am. But there's a lot of ways, praise God, that that's how I was, but that's not how I am and it's not how I am becoming, right? And so one of the questions that I get a lot is, how exactly do generational patterns work? I speak at churches sometimes where people will use a phrase generational curse. You know, they'll describe it as a generational curse and they'll they'll reference, you know, that you stand on one mountain, blessings and curses in that passage, and they'll talk about this this theological idea. And I've got some some challenges with maybe being in Christ and having a curse on my life necessarily, but I do understand what they mean with the wording. And so one of the things I always ask is what role do we then play? Because in a curse, there's an indication that I don't play an active role in it, that it's the spiritual state that I exist in now versus a pattern is something that I'm continuing, right? It's something that I'm perpetuating. And so I'm curious, how do we actively adopt these generational patterns or are they more just intrinsically sort of passed down to us without our involvement? Are we, in other words, are we a little powerless to resist that generational pattern um, or to even resist it impacting our life or do we actively engage it? And so I'm interested a little bit in, in sort of the mechanics of how generational patterns work. Brooke, would you like to share any thoughts on, on maybe how, how the mechanics of that work? Absolutely. Um, and I'm, y'all, if I get to preaching, just shut it down. Um, I can <laughs> Okay, we will. We will. And if you're listening, if you're listening, we're happy to send you a healing rag for a donation of any (laughs) amount. We will send it right to your door. Uh, That is sarcasm. Please do not take that out of context. No, I, you know, at at Mercy, you know, obviously we, we do, you know, this highest level clinical work with the deepest spiritual. And so we really combine this, this really, you know, the awesome counseling practices with, partnering with the Lord in that. And so that's obviously one of the scriptures that we look at and we're talking about, even if you get into this, and so I'm going to, I'm going to just drop this and then I'll move on to kind of a clinical piece of it, but okay. We can, if you really dig into whether or not it's curses, like, and really evaluate the language, it's actually really not there minus that one scripture and kind of reading that in context. But also if we as Christians have come into a new bloodline with Christ and Jesus breaks all curses, right? Well, then we have an opportunity to partner with him in that. Doesn't mean there won't be struggles. Doesn't mean there won't be, you know, whatever else it is. But the cool thing is what Jesus does is he goes, hey, look, that's a pattern. That's something that you got from your life, your experiences and the brokenness of what this world is. And now let me free you from that. And what we have a choice to make is we can decide this is just how I am right? This is just, you know, what I do. Um, and, you know, or we can go, okay, that I recognize that now. And okay, Lord, what are you going to do to heal me and bring me out of that? And I think I want to comment too, that I think culturally we have accepted that from even a mental health perspective, right? Um, Mm. my husband's dad, uh, struggled with addiction. He passed away um, a few years ago. And one of the things was he got really high on more opiates than I care to mention, drove the wrong way down the interstate in Hendersonville, uh, broke his back. It was just this awful situation. So my husband and I, we were living in Louisiana at the time, came up here trying to figure it all out. And my husband is telling the doctor, he goes, look, now he's, you know, he struggles with addiction. So they're obviously giving him pain medicine and all that. So please be mindful of that. 
And the doctor looks at my husband and says, well, it's hereditary. And mm. looks at my husband as if that, and that was his answer to us saying, hey, be mindful of that. Now, I was too far down the hall to physically um, injure the doctor. Um, and so I didn't make it quite enough, you know, to be, but I was like, well, hang on a second. What are, what do you mean by that? Like, what does that have to do with anything? And he's like, well, I just want, you know, your husband to know he should be careful. Yeah. What, what? Like, yeah. and so I know it ended up being just this whole thing. And, and it, it really pushed me as a clinician of just being like, we put this stuff on people that they're not even looking for, right? This wasn't even the context for that conversation. There's nobody was even saying that. And so you have people who go and go, hey, I've been really sad because I've walked through some hard things. And our mental health community goes, yep, you're depressed, right? Or it's wow. an appropriate reaction to stressors and you need to grieve. Mm -hmm. And there's a process for grieving. You know, how wow. many times do you know someone go to their doctor, my spouse passed away and I'm really having a hard time. And they're like, well, here's some Valium. Right. Yeah. That's not how we treat that. And so it, what it does is it keeps people They go, well, this is just what I have. And they quit exploring that. <clears throat> and that's what I feel like the message of the church has to be is, no, let's explore it. And God has something good. And it doesn't mean it will be perfect. And it doesn't mean it will be easy. But he is asking you to partner with him in doing that, you know. Yeah. And Brooke, I have to jump in. I love what you said. You know, uh, this idea just kind of hit me and, and, you know, you probably picked on it. I'm a little slow on the uptake for our listeners. That's when good. Brooke said that we have a choice, chance to join Christ in a new bloodline. I mean, this is extremely powerful when you think of the idea about generational patterns, because generational, you're, you're, you're joining a new bloodline that actually has perfect blood running through it, right? Perfect patterns, perfect behavior. And so it's pretty crazy. You can think that in one way you can you're starting to break free from the worldly, the carnal bloodline that maybe did pass down some painful patterns to you. And you're merging into you're getting a transfusion almost of a new bloodline. That's a powerful idea when it comes to generational patterns. And uh, yeah, that's awesome. Good words there. And I love the idea, too. Of we don't want to block wanna, the we don't, natural processes that God gave us as well. Right. I mean, that's so strong. Adam, any thoughts on any of this? And then I want to get to a, a question that one of our our listeners had no, asked I, us to I think that today. Any, any thoughts on this? You know, we growing up in the church, uh, and I've told numerous people this that you know, my, when my mother remarried, she remarried a, an assembly of God pastor. So uh, naturally, I was in church twelve days a week and uh, every service. Like I got saved, uh, I got little air quotes up every time they gave an altar call. Uh, did you did you get saved or did because because if, if you didn't I mean if you spoke in tongues every Sunday every maybe Sunday um, you got saved Adam but what yeah, nobody exactly. ever told me was that the true power that we have as followers of Christ isn't in the preaching that is based on fear it is the response of our lives how we live to the love that He has demonstrated for us and in that. Yes, there are generational issues, obviously. We, well, that's what we're talking about here. But you, as a follower of Christ, who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, the perfect sacrifice, you have been empowered to overcome. You have been empowered to overcome. The, the logo, uh, the, the tagline on my logo says Semper Invictus, which means always undefeated. You know, I, for a long time I thought, Faith makes me a weak man, it makes me a passive man, and it's going to make me a weak cop. And what I realized when I was redeemed, truly, truly surrendered to Christ, is that I became unconquerable. Not because that nothing can hurt me in this life. Obviously, we're going to have trouble here. But I've been given the power to overcome it. And if you are a follower of Christ, you have been given every power to overcome those things that have tried to destroy you and every family member in your lineage. And it's time for you to take that power, apply it to your mind through the renewing of your mind, through reading of his word, and take the power of the presence of God in your life and take the, the head of that snake and cut it off. Cut it off. 
and being intentional about the daily things that you do. Change your mindset, your perspective about those things and discover who you are. There's a warrior inside of you that's ready to take care of that stuff so that it is not passed down any further than where you're at right now. So um, I will be taking up a love offering at the end, but I'm done for now. So I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's a joke. It's, it's an inside joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, no, th- no, that's that's amazing. I would have. I would have never guessed you spend any time in the Assemblies <laughs> of God Church, Adam. I would have never guessed that, dude. That's that's good. You both are amazing, you know. And and I love, you know, even with 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 your books, Adam. A lot of what you're writing these days talks about that principle, but also even the work that you do, you know, um, Brooke with Mercy Multiplied. You talk about this idea of life limiting, life controlling behaviors. You know, breaking life controlling behaviors. That one of the questions that we received from one of our our podcast subscribers, she asked this, she said, I have a son who's 24 years old and I see him making some of the same mistakes that I did when I was his age, but I'm not sure how to help him. What should I say to him to get him to see that I had to learn the hard way and that the choices that we make in our twenties can change the trajectory of our entire lives? You know, and I think this is a tough one as a parent because you don't, you don't always have that seat of authority anymore. When somebody's 23, 24, you know, mom, dad, I got this figured out. Maybe some of our listeners are dealing with this with their kids right now. How do you have conversations where you say, hey, this is a pattern in our family. It took me till I was 52 years old to see the pattern. You can change the pattern. How do you have that conversation? Mm -hmm. What do you all think? Brooke, do you want to go first? Adam, do you want to go first? I will go. Um, <laughs> you can't give us both an option. We're both like, we have so many things. Um, All right. Well, from now on, I, mean, I will honestly, delegate. Bro, take best. it away. Um, I, I will say, I'm gonna, so I'll speak to this from just a therapeutic standpoint, right? <laughs> so if I have, I have mom in, in my counseling room and we're talking through this, I think number one is really evaluating the actual relationship that you have with your child. I think a lot of times we as parents, you know, number one these patterns, these behaviors didn't just show up at 23, 24. They were there the whole time. And, I, and I'm speaking as a parent of a 10 year old and every day I have a choice to see something or ignore something. Mm. Right. And I mean, it just is what it is. And so I think that kind of looking back and really assessing, do you have a place outside of being a parent? Do you have a relationship to actually speak into something? Um, you know, do Great. you have the rapport with your kid to sit them down and go, Hey, I need to share some things with you. Um, and I think if, if that's not there first, then my, th- I think that has to be established first, you know? Um, and, and a lot of that is listening, even when your kid's not doing, you know, I know more about legends of Zelda than anybody ever should know. And every day is like, can I tell you about legend of Zelda breath of the wild? And I'm like, mm-hmm, yes. And so he tells me all about it. So if y'all want to know, <laughs> I I'll hope that you're watching you. our, and I just want to pause. I hope you're watching our video stream of this if you're listening, because Brooke's face when she was describing Legend of Zelda looked like she was smelling a stinky sock. I just want to point that out. It was glorious. It's some, it was you glorious. know what? It's because I have to control my face every other moment of my life, but here I can be free to show the feeling. Right, right. That I have. Yeah, this is um, a safe yeah. place. You're not. You're not on video or anything, so you're fine. That's yeah. right. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's smart. It starts with that. And the Lord told me, he was like, you better listen to this because one day he's going to be talking to you about things that you need to speak into. And so you better sit there and listen to him talk about things you don't want to hear. And I was like, okay, Jesus. And so, that is so, but, good. so, and he, you know what, and he gives you grace for those times. Um, oh, that's good. So any, when he's telling you about what outfits Link wears. So I'll leave that there, but all that to say, like, I think number one, it starts with that place. And then the next thing is, truly sharing from, are you trying to manipulate them into changing behavior? Or are you really wanting to just say, I've got, you are now a grown man and I need to tell you some things that I'm seeing that really concern me. And I want to share that with you. And I just want you to hear it. You do whatever you need to do with it because I've got you. I'm praying for you. I love you. Right. But if you come into it, trying to manipulate them and think that your grown child is going to go, you know what? I am now forever changed by this moment. You are going to be grossly disappointed, especially if you need that. If that comes from an insecure place, your child will not give it to you. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. That's just what it is. And so I think really that like, what, what is the relationship? What are your intentions going into it? And how can you from a vulnerable place 
give them information that they now as a grown child get to decide whether or not they're going to do anything with it. And then let them know when, and maybe they're like, I don't see a problem. I don't think it's an issue. And then your response is that's totally fine. And if you do, I will be here to talk you through it because I've learned some lessons in my life and just opening that door to actually being someone to have dialogue with them. Because I think so many times we isolate, that's what we do. We go get in our own mess and we get away from anybody that can teach us anything healthy. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what I would wow. say. Yeah, man, that is, that is you so know what? I've got several uh, thoughts I think on you that. hit the nail on the head. Share anything? Yeah, lead, with, lead with love in these conversations and, and make sure that you actually sit down and, and tell them, uh, this is what I see, but let me back up. and Because what they're going to say is, well, you did it, and look at how you turned out. You turned out okay, so just leave me alone. Let me go through it, right? And, and I'll be fine. Let me do my own thing. Instead of, of actually laying out, you right. know, in, in a very loving way, not manipulative. I, you hit the nail on the head. Don't try to manipulate them to change the behavior. Lead with love based on truth and facts and, and kind of just give them your experience and be vulnerable. Again, I'm going to go back to Mark's quote, Mark Batterson. Your moment of bravery creates a moment of somebody else's breakthrough. And, and if you're willing to be vulnerable with them, it may not cause them to change anything in that moment. But you're planting a seed and you've done your part and you can't force them, especially at 24 yeah. years old, whether you're yeah, 24 years old. So what should I say to them? I, I think Brooke hit it on the head. You share from a vulnerable position what you went through because maybe they don't know. You see it from your seat but maybe they don't know and how it affected you share the pain that you've experienced and share. Yeah, I've turned out. Okay. But I, I don't want you to have to go through these things. And so, you know, but again, you got to have that rapport. You got to have the relationship. And sometimes that's not, that, that's, that's easier said than done, but yeah, Brooke summed it up pretty good. She did a great job on that. So. Yeah. No, I love I love the idea of, you know, I always coach people to lead with grace and follow with truth. And one of the phrases that I use a lot, especially if you're listening, you're a parent or if you're a pastor type person or disciple or, you know, I always say, hey, look, I want to share something with you. But I want you to know before I share it, that whether or not you take any of my advice or none of my advice, it doesn't change how I feel about you. And that's a very freeing phrase, you know, that I've used a lot. And I will say this is something that I appreciate. This is a mom asking about her son, but this is something that I've felt a lot with people that I've shepherded and discipled over the years. I see them making decisions that I'm saying, you don't have to make this decision. And how do you walk with that person? How do you let them on their own journey can be really, really challenging. You know, in in my experience, this old phrase of life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. In my experience, largely I've found that to be true, that, that you are or I am in control of the decisions that I make. Meaning from this moment now, today, hearing this, saying these words, I'm in charge of what happens for the most part in the choices that I make, how I respond to situations in the future. So while my past may have heavily influ- been influenced by those who raised me or you, if you're listening, uh, my future is my responsibility. It sits on my hands to be able to determine. And so whether if you're a son of somebody who's listening, whether you're a parent, that you have input, you have say, you're not a helpless passenger on the train of life, and you're not a victim of what's happened to you in your past. You have power. As Adam said, you can be unconquerable. I love that word that you moved. And you can ask the question, am I going to repeat the mistakes of my ancestors, or am I going to chart a new course? Am I going to blend with that new bloodline and do something better? And that's a question that only you, if you're listening, have an answer to. I can't answer that question for you. That is uniquely something you have to wrestle with yourself. Say, can you be better than the generation before you? Can you be better than the generation before you? And that's the question I think that we should end with today. Hopefully you'll think about that. Again, this is a new format for us. We're thankful for you listening to it. This is the second season of the Reboot Recovery Show. On behalf of myself and Brooke and Adam, thank you so much for joining us. As always, please make sure to leave that five-star review, whether you use iTunes or whatever, write a little review for us. That really does help us. A lot of people look at those reviews to determine if they should listen to our show or not. And there's somebody right now who's hurting, who's in a desperate place, who will decide if they're going to listen to this content or not based on your 35 seconds it takes to leave us that review. So please, please go do that. Next week, we're going to be talking about setting and accepting boundaries when you've been wounded by trauma. 
setting and, and, and accepting boundaries when you've been wounded by trauma. It's going to be a really, really helpful discussion. So I hope that you'll join us. And until next time, keep moving forward as we overcome trauma together.